This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 7, Jesus, the Anchor of the Soul, ready for teaching on February 12. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 5. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came and that he lived a life that provided salvation for each of us. And as we look at this week's lesson, as we look further into Hebrews chapter 5 and 6 and 7, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us and bless us. And we're listening in many different parts of the world, dear Lord. And today I'd like to pray for those people who are listening in the Caribbean. Uh, particularly in Trinidad and Tobago and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, Jamaica, Haiti, Granada, uh, Dominican Republic, Dominica, Cuba, Cayman Islands, Barbados, Bahamas, Aruba, or Antigua and Barbuda. For in many of these countries, this podcast of the Sabbath School Lesson is the number one Christian podcast at various times. I'd like to pray for everyone who's listening, dear Heavenly Father. I'd like to pray for their families, for their churches, and for their communities. We know that in recent years there have been many major hurricanes in this area and other natural disasters. And we pray that as people are hurting, that your Holy Spirit will be there to guide and that your people may be able to give a a helping hand. And if we need a helping hand, Lord, We pray that our eyes may be open to receive it. Bless us as we study your word. This week we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both secure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to chapter 6, verse 20, interrupts the theological exposition about Jesus' priesthood in our behalf. Paul inserts there a severe warning about the danger of falling away from Christ. Let's read that now. We'll begin at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, And this we will do if God permits. For it is possible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame." For the earth, which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. 
For God is not unjust to forget your work and labour of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Apparently, the people were in real danger of going down the slippery slope of self-pity and faithlessness. The Apostle Paul is concerned that his readers and hearers may have had their spiritual senses dulled because of the difficult situations they were facing and thus they had stopped growing in their understanding and experience of the gospel. Is not this a potential danger for us all, getting discouraged because of trials and thus falling away? The severe warning culminates, however, in an affectionate encouragement. Paul expresses faith in his readers and exalts Jesus as the embodiment of God's unbreakable promise of salvation to them in verses 9 to 20 of Hebrews 6. This cycle of warning and encouragement is repeated in Hebrews 10, 26-39. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But, Recall the former days in which, after you were eliminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. We will study this cycle and focus on the strong words of encouragement that Jesus provides for us. Sunday, February 6, Tasting the Goodness of the Word 
Read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. What were believers given in Christ while they were faithful to him? Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 4. For how can those who abandon their faith be brought back to repent again? They were once in God's light. They tasted heaven's gift and received their share of the Holy Spirit. They knew from experience that God's word is good. And they had felt the powers of the coming age. To have been enlightened means to have experienced conversion, as we read in Hebrews 10.32. Remember how it was with you in the past. In those days, after God's light had shone on you, you suffered many things. You were not defeated by the struggle. It refers to those who have turned from the darkness of the power of Satan to the light of God, as you read in Acts 26, verses 17 and 18. I will rescue you from the people of Israel and from the Gentiles to whom I will send you. You are to open their eyes and turn them from the darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God, so that through their faith in me... They will have their sins forgiven and receive their place among God's chosen people. It implies deliverance from sin, as we read in Ephesians 5 verse 11. Have nothing to do with the worthless things that people do, things that belong to the darkness. Instead, bring them out to the light. And ignorance, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 and 5. But you, friends, are not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. The verbal form here suggests that this enlightening is an act of God achieved through Jesus, the brightness of his glory, as we read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. To have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit are synonymous expressions. The gift of God may refer to his grace, as we read in Romans 5 verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offence, for if by the one man's offence many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Or, to the Holy Spirit, through whom God imparts that grace, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who have tasted the Holy Spirit have experienced the grace of God, which includes the power to fulfill His will, as we read in John 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any one thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And 1 Corinthians 12:13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And Galatians five twenty two to twenty three. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. To taste the goodness of the Word of God, as we find in Hebrews 6.5, is to experience personally the truth of the Gospel that we read about in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. The powers of the age to come refers to the miracles God will perform for believers in the future. Resurrection, as evidenced in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation transformation of our bodies and eternal life. 
Believers, however, are beginning to taste them in the presence. They have experienced a spiritual resurrection, as you read in Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, have raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. A renewed mind, we read about in Romans 12 too, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God." and eternal life in Christ, we read about in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Paul probably had in mind the wilderness generation who experienced the grace of God and his salvation. The wilderness generation was enlightened by the pillar of fire, as we read in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 12 and 19. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. And verse 19, Yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light, and the way they should go. And Psalm 105, verse 39, He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. They enjoyed the heavenly gift of manna, as you read in Exodus 16, 15. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. They experienced the Holy Spirit, as you read in Nehemiah 9.20. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and gave them water for their thirst. They tasted the good word of God, as Joshua 21.45 says, and the powers of the age to come in the wonders and signs performed in their deliverance from Egypt, as recorded in Acts 7.36. Paul suggests, however, that just as the wilderness generation apostatized from God, despite those evidences in Numbers 14, the audience of Hebrews was in danger of doing the same, despite all the evidence of God's favour that they had enjoyed. Let's read Numbers 14, verses 1 to 35. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt." Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with with us, do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me, and how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. 
And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord God, are among those people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord is not able to bring his people to the land which he swore to them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven these people from Egypt even until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who reject me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and who followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number, from twenty years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely, forty years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And so to finish today, what has been your own experience with the things that these verses in Hebrews have talked about? For instance, how have you experienced the enlightening that the text refers to? Monday, February 7, Impossible to Restore Compare Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, Matthew 16, 24, Romans 6, 6, Galatians 2, 20, Galatians 5, 24, and Galatians 6, 14. What does this comparison suggest about what it means to crucify Christ? First of all, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. And Matthew sixteen twenty four. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, 
and follow me. And Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And then Galatians 2, 20, and this is my favourite Bible text of all times. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And Galatians 5, 24, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And Galatians six fourteen, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What does this comparison suggest about what it means to crucify Christ? The original text in Greek emphasises the word impossible. It is impossible for God to restore those who have fallen away because they are crucifying once again the Son of God, we read in Hebrews 6.6. 6. Paul wants to stress that there is no other way of salvation except through Christ in Acts 4.12. Salvation by any other means is as impossible as it is for God to lie, as we read in Hebrews 6.18, or to please God without faith, as is recorded in Hebrews 11 verse 6. To crucify again the Son of God is a figurative expression that seeks to describe something that happens in the personal relationship between Jesus and the believer. When the religious leaders crucified Jesus, they did it because Jesus posed a threat to their supremacy and autonomy. Thus, they hoped to eliminate Jesus as a person and destroy a powerful and dangerous enemy. Similarly, the gospel challenges the sovereignty and self-determination of the individual at the most fundamental level. The essence of Christian life is to take up the cross and deny oneself as we read in Matthew 16.24. This means to crucify the world, as we read in Galatians 6.14, the old man in Romans 6.6, 6, and the flesh with its passions as in desires, as you read in Galatians 5.24. The purpose of the Christian life is that we undergo a kind of death. Unless we experience this death to self, we cannot receive the new life God wants to give us, as you read in Romans 6, verses 1 to 11. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin." For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The struggle between Jesus and self is a struggle to the death, as you read in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. It is a difficult battle that is not won at once. This passage does not refer to the person who sometimes fails in the battle against the old man and the flesh. This sin refers to the person who 
after having experienced genuine salvation and what it implies, as we read before in Hebrews 6, 4 and 5, decides that Jesus is a threat to the kind of life he or she wants to have and moves to kill their relationship with him. That is, as long as the person does not fully choose to turn away from Christ, there is still the hope of salvation. And so to finish today, what does it mean to die to self to take up the cross? What is the thing that you find most important to hand over to the dominion of Christ? Tuesday, February 8. No sacrifice for sins left. The warning of Hebrews 6, 4-6, which you read yesterday, is very similar to the warning found in Hebrews 10, 26-29. Let's read Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 4 again. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucified again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. And Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit? Of grace. Paul explains that the rejection of Jesus' sacrifice will leave the readers without any means for the forgiveness of sin because there is no other means for that forgiveness besides Jesus, as we read in Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 14. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offered continually year by year, make those who are approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God." Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified." Read Hebrews 10, verses 26 to 29. In what ways does the author describe the sin for which there is no forgiveness? Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 26. 
Therefore, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. The author does not say that there is no atonement for any sin committed after receiving the knowledge of the truth. God has appointed Jesus as our advocate, as we read in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Through him we have forgiveness of sins, as we read in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The sin for which there is no sacrifice or atonement is described as trampling underfoot the Son of God, profaning the blood of the covenant, and outraging the Holy Spirit, as we just read in Hebrews 10:29. Let's review the meaning of these expressions. The expression, trampled the Son of God underfoot, in Hebrews 10.29, describes the rejection of Jesus' rule. The title, Son of God, reminded the audience that God has installed Jesus at his right hand and promised to make his enemies a footstool for his feet, as we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? And also Hebrews 1 verses 5 to 12. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And the Lord in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your hearts will not fail. And verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The trampling of Jesus underfoot implies that the apostate has treated Jesus as an enemy. In the context of the argument of the epistle, in verse 13, it could be implied that, as far as the life of the apostate is concerned, Jesus has been taken off the throne, which is occupied now by the apostate himself, and set as the footstool instead. This is what Lucifer wanted to do in heaven, as we read in Isaiah fourteen twelve to 14 and what the lawless one would attempt to do in the future. And we'll read Second Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4 as well. But first of all, Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 12. How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And second. Thessalonians 2, 3-4. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God." 
The expression, has profaned the blood of the covenant, refers to the rejection of Jesus' sacrifice in Hebrews 9, 15-22. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then, likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. It implies that the blood of Jesus is devoid of cleansing power. The expression insulted the spirit of grace is very powerful. The Greek term any brisas, or insult, or outrage, involves the manifestation of hubris, which refers to insolence or arrogance. This term stands in stark contrast to the description of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Grace. It implies that the apostate has responded to God's offer of grace with an insult. The apostate is in an unintenable position. He rejects Jesus, his sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit. Wednesday, February 9. Better Things. After the strong and sincere warning of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 8, Paul expresses confidence that the readers have neither fallen away from the sun, nor will they in the future. He believes that his audience will receive the warning and produce the appropriate fruits. They are like the earth, which is cultivated by God and produces the fruits he expects. These people will receive the blessing from God in verse 7, which is salvation as expressed in verse 9. Read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. List the good things that the audience has done and continues to do and explain what they mean. Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 9. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labour of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Believers show their love toward God's name, that is, toward God himself, by their service to the saints. These were not isolated actions in the past, but sustained actions that have extended into the present. Exceptional acts do not reveal the true character of a person. The weightiest evidence of love toward God is not religious acts per se, but acts of love toward fellow human beings, especially those who are disadvantaged. As we read in Matthew 10.42, And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lease his reward. And Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. 
Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then... He will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Thus Paul exhorts believers not to forget to do good in Hebrews 13 verse 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. And Hebrews 13 verse 16. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12 that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It warns against becoming dull or sluggish, which characterises those who fail to mature and who are in danger of falling away, as we read in Hebrews 6.12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises, and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Hope is not kept alive by intellectual exercises of faith, but by faith expressed in actions of love, as we read in Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and, if there be any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. Paul wants the readers to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He already has presented the wilderness generation as a negative example of those who, through lack of faith and perseverance, failed to inherit what was promised. He then presents Abraham in Hebrews 6, 13-15 as an example of one who, through faith and patience, inherited the promises. Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. The list of positive exemplars is lengthened with the people of faith in Hebrews 11, and it climaxes with Jesus in Hebrews 12 as the greatest example of faith and patience, as we read in Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the 
author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin." In Revelation 14:12, faith, patience, and commandment keeping are characteristics of the saints in the last days. Let's read that. Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So to finish the day. Sometimes we have to give words of warning to those people whom we love. What can we learn from the Apostle regarding warning and encouraging others? Thursday, February 10. Jesus, the anchor of the soul. Paul culminates his warning against apostasy and encouragement toward love and faith with a beautiful, soaring exposition of assurance in Christ. Read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 to 20. How did God guarantee his promises to us? Hebrews 6, beginning at verse 17. Thus God, determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. God guaranteed his promises for us in several ways. First, God guaranteed his promise with an oath, we read in verse 17. According to scripture, God's oaths to Abraham and David became the ultimate basis of confidence in God's permanent favour toward Israel. When Moses sought to secure God's forgiveness for Israel after the apostasy with the golden calf, he referred to God's oath to Abraham, as we read in Exodus 32, verses 11 to 14. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your descendants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. And let's go back to Genesis 22 verses 16 to 18 to the original story. And said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The implied strength of his plea was that God's oath was irrevocable, as we read in Romans 9 4, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. And Romans eleven twenty eight and 29. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
Similarly, when the psalmist interceded before God for Israel, he claimed God's oath to David. God had said in Psalm 89, verses 34 to 37, I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness. I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. According to the New Testament, both oaths were fulfilled in Jesus, the seed of Abraham, who ascended and was seated on the throne of David, as we read in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. So beginning at verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And Luke 1, verses 31 to 33, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. And Luke chapter 1 verses 54 to 55. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever. Second, God has guaranteed his promises to us by the act of seating Jesus at his right hand. Jesus' ascension has the purpose of corroborating the promise made to the believers because Jesus ascended as a forerunner on our behalf, we read in Hebrews 6.20. Thus, the ascension reveals to us the certainty of God's salvation for us. God led Jesus to glory through the suffering of death for everyone, so that he might bring many children to glory, we read in Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. Jesus' presence before the Father is the anchor of the soul, we read in Hebrews 6, verse 19, which has been fastened to the throne of God. The honour of God's rule has been waged on the fulfilment of his promise to us through Jesus. What more assurance do we need? And so to finish today, what do you feel when you think about the fact that God has made an oath to you? Why should that thought alone help give you assurance of salvation even when you feel unworthy? Friday, February 11. From the book Steps to Christ, page 43, we read, The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. End of quote. And by the same author, the Acts of the Apostles, page 544 and 545, we read, John desired to become like Jesus, and under the transforming influence of the love of Christ, he did become meek and lowly. Self was hid in Jesus. Above all his companions, John yielded himself to the power of that wondrous life. It was John's deep love for Christ which led him always to desire to be close by his side. The Saviour loved all the twelve, but John's was the most receptive spirit. He was younger than the others, and with more of the child's confiding trust, he opened his heart to Jesus. Thus he came more into sympathy with Christ, and through him the Saviour's deepest spiritual teaching was communicated to the people. 
The beauty of holiness, which had transformed him, shone with a Christ-like radiance from his countenance. In adoration and love he beheld the Saviour, until likeness to Christ and fellowship with him became his one desire, and in his character was reflected the character of his Master. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. The lives of John, the beloved disciple, and Judas Iscariot provide an important contrast. When Jesus saw John and his brother, he called them Boanerges, sons of thunder. John had grave defects. Judas also had defects. But they were not more dramatic or serious than John's. Why did John come to be transformed into the image of Jesus, while Judas committed the sin against the Holy Spirit? What was the difference? 2. Jesus invites believers to take up their crosses and follow him. What is the difference between taking the cross and submitting to abuse from others? And three, why does God require a total surrender of our lives to him? What is the relationship between free will and salvation? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Sugar Shock and it's by Andrew McChesney. Yong, a sugar factory worker in Laos, was baptised, but he lost interest in Jesus after about three years. The pastor visited him at home with an invitation to return to church to worship on Sabbath. Yes, I will come, Yong promised, but he didn't. When the pastor returned to invite him again, Yong explained that he had missed church services because a friend had stopped by his house unexpectedly. I'll come next Sabbath, he said. But he didn't. When the pastor returned again, Yong explained that his bicycle had broken down. The pastor visited many times, and Yong always had an excuse. Church members prayed, and the pastor kept inviting him, but Yong seemed to drift further away from Jesus. After some time, he started to drink and cause problems at home. He often beat his older sister, leaving bruises on her face, arms and legs. His sister, a faithful church member, finally had to move out of the house, leaving him with his wife and children. The sister came to church with tears in her eyes. She loved her brother. Please don't stop praying for Ong, she said. One day, Yong was working at the sugar factory. He climbed a steel ladder to fetch sugar from a giant steel container. The activity was a normal part of his job. But on this day, an electric wire connected to the steel container malfunctioned. As he reached out his hands to grasp the top edge of the container, a shock of electricity coursed through his hands and body. The electric current welded him to the container. He couldn't move his hands from the edge. At that moment, he thought of his family. Then he remembered God. God, please help me, he prayed. Suddenly, the electric current stopped, and he fell down to the floor. Only one thought filled his mind. God has given me a new life to live again. Young should have died, but he was alive. His left hand was burned badly in the incident, but otherwise he was fine. Villagers couldn't believe that he was still alive. Yong told his wife that he planned to recommit his life to Jesus. I must go back to church, for God has given me a new life, he said. I must be a witness for him, because I should have died, but I am alive. I must go back to him. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the gospel to people in Laos and other countries of the Southern Asia-Pacific Division, which will receive this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, 
God is always faithful.